Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his new and revealing series, Faithful and True. Sometimes life delivers some devastating and destructive blows to our lives, much like what God did to the people of Egypt. Why? Learn God's purpose for your hardship in the lesson called, Here Come the Plagues. Now, I've entitled this series, Faithful and True, Introducing the One and Only God. Pharaoh thought he was God. Now, there's a showdown. It's like the gunfight at the OK Corral. God is going to show Pharaoh and Egypt and the Hebrews that he is the Lord. He says over and over in the book of Exodus, then they will know that I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. Who is the Lord? You're going to know who is the Lord because I'm getting ready to unleash plagues upon you. Now, if you remember, when Moses first came to Pharaoh, well, Pharaoh, he said that, who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice, and he didn't let them go. And uh, furthermore, he made it worse on them. He made them make bricks without straw, but he said, your, uh, your quota of bricks is going to still be the same. And they said, how can we do this? And they began to be beaten, and it was difficult, and they got mad. The people got mad at Moses. They said, you've made us odious in the sight of Pharaoh. And now things are worse than anything. And Moses went to the Lord and said, Lord, you, you haven't, why did you send me? The things are worse, and you haven't redeemed Israel at all. And now God says, now you will see what I will do. I'm going to make a mockery of Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. I'm going to unleash the plagues. Exodus chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh will not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my hosts my people, the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. So Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them. Thus they did. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Now here's the question I want you to consider. You, you, you know about the ten plagues. I mean, the ten plagues were devastating plagues. It was after plague seven that the servants of Pharaoh said, Pharaoh, do you not understand that Egypt is destroyed? I mean, that's how bad it was because God has three more plagues to go and Egypt is destroyed. After plague three, they said, this is the finger of God. It is bad, bad, bad for Egypt. Now, why does God deal so harshly with Egypt? I want to share with you two reasons why and then three key lessons we learn as we talk about the first three plagues that were inflicted upon Egypt. These judgments, these punishments, these blows from God to Pharaoh in the Egyptians. So why was it so harsh? Reason number one, Egypt was ripe for judgment. Ripe for judgment. God had told Abraham way back in Genesis 15 what was going to happen in the future. And the Lord said to Abraham, Abraham's name hadn't even been changed at that point. It was just Abram. And God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs 
where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 100 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve. And afterward, they will come out with many possessions. God had told Abram that he was going to judge this nation. Didn't tell him which nation it was. It was the nation, obviously, of Egypt. And Egypt was ripe for judgment. Now, very interesting. Joseph gets sent to Egypt ahead of time. He's sold as a slave into Egypt. Joseph is the 11th son of his father Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that's the lineage. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. When we talk about the children of Israel, it's the children of Jacob. Well, Jacob has 12 sons, 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so when Joseph goes down to Egypt, he's sold as a slave, then he ends up in prison, but then he ends up interpreting the dream for Pharaoh, and he becomes prime minister of Egypt. And when there's a, a seven years of plenty, he conducts all the affairs, stores up all this grain to get ready for the seven years of famine, and people come to get grain from Joseph, and they find out that Joseph isn't dead, he's alive, and so Jacob slash Israel, same person, he comes down and moves all his family to Egypt, and Joseph provides for them, and the scripture says 70 persons in all came down out of Jacob's family to Egypt. Well, now fast forward 400 plus years, and there are about two and a half million Hebrews living in Egypt. Well, the Egyptians, there arose a new Pharaoh who did not know uh, Joseph, and they, they get nervous because there's so many of these Hebrews, and they said, well, what if they don't side with us? If we go to war, we could be in trouble. So that's when they began to enslave them. They were ripe for judgment. Now, let's look at why they were ripe for judgment. Number one, Egypt was grossly idolatrous. They had gods on top of gods, grossly idolatrous. Exodus 12, 12, in God's Word version, says, the Lord says this, I will severely punish all the gods of Egypt because I am the Lord. And the plagues that come upon Egypt are plagues upon their gods to show to Pharaoh and all the Egyptians and all the Hebrews that the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Now, the number one commandment of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. God says, I am the only God. You don't have a, another God before me. That means instead of me or alongside of me. There is no other God. I alone am God. The second commandment, no idol worship. Egypt had all their gods before the true God, and they had all their idols. And God says, judgment is coming, first of all, because you're grossly idolatrous. Interesting scripture, you might want to write this down. Revelation 21, verse 8 says this. Revelation 21 talks about the new heavens and the new earth, and it is so awesome for those in heaven. And then it says, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their part shall be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. Idolaters is one of those that the Lord lists. God hates idolatry. They were grossly idolatrous. Secondly, Egypt was brutal and bloodthirsty. Brutal in the way that they treated the Hebrews, enslaving them, and bloodthirsty in the way they treated the Hebrew baby boys. Exodus chapter 1 says this, And the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and all, at all kinds of labor in the field. And all their labors which they rigorously imposed upon them. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named uh, Shifra, and the other was named Pua. And he said, When you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, then you, you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. In verse 22. 
Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son, Hebrew son, who is born, you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. Brutal with their slavery, bloodthirsty in killing the baby boys. Now, Pharaoh is a picture of the devil, and the devil is going up against God. And know this about the devil. He always wants to kill the babies. He always wants to kill the babies. What happened when Jesus was born? What did Herod say? Go into Bethlehem and kill all the babies. They're killing babies, Hebrew baby boys, in the book of Exodus. They're killing Hebrew baby boys in the New Testament. In America today, we're killing boys and girls by the untold millions through Planned Parenthood. The devil always wants to kill the babies. Egypt was brutal and bloodthirsty. And thirdly, Egypt was arrogant and stubborn. Arrogant and stubborn. Think about the arrogance of Pharaoh's statement to Moses. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? It's just that that's the core of sin, the heart of sin. Who is the Lord that I, I mean, I'm somebody that I should obey his voice? Now, you can say, well, he had never heard of that name, Yahweh, okay? And so maybe it was a, a genuine question, okay? But it was a, an arrogant question, a prideful question, because who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Hey, six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Number one on God's hate list, haughty eyes. A proud look. God hates pride. And Israel, uh, Egypt was so proud and arrogant. And they were stubborn. So stubborn. Verse 14 of chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. That, that word stubborn in the, Greek, in the Hebrew, that word means to be slow to be heavy, to be thick, to be difficult, to be stupid. That was Pharaoh's heart. He, he uh, epitomized the people. I mean, he is their representative. He is Pharaoh. He is the, the head of Egypt. And the people were heavy in heart. They were slow. They were difficult. They were hard. The other word that's used for Pharaoh having a hardened heart is the, the Hebrew word kazak, which means obstinate and hard and rigid. Now, you read in Exodus 7, verse 3, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. And you say, well, Pharaoh didn't do that. God did that to Pharaoh. Well, interesting. You take some time to read in the book of Exodus. You read the story in Exodus, and what you'll find is there are seven references to Pharaoh having a hard heart, hardening his own heart before God ever hardens his heart. The first reference to God hardening his heart. Now, he says in Exodus 7, 3 that he's going to harden his heart, but the first reference that God actually hardened his heart was... Exodus 9, verse 12, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Seven times before that, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. What do we glean from that? When Pharaoh hardened his heart and 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 hardened his heart, hardened his heart then God began to say, okay, that's the direction you want to go. Uh, you're, you're, you're taking a step in that direction. I'm going to give you a shove. I'm going to push you in that direction. You are going to have a hard heart. I'm going to solidify and fortify your heart decision. Arrogant and stubborn. You think about those sins that made them ripe for judgment. Does not America have those same sins? Idolatry. Man, we worship money. We worship sex. We worship power. We worship popularity. Brutality. Bloodthirstiness with the abortion that covers our land arrogant, stubborn. We're so ripe for judgment. And God has let down the hedge of protection on our land, I believe. He's trying to wake people up to say, hey, what is it going to take for you to get right with me? What is it going to take for you to pray 
and to seek my face. Because we, as the people of God, hold the key. And if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will heal their sin, will we'll forgive their sin, and will heal their land. God is waiting on us. We had prayer time. We have prayer time every Saturday night at 6.30. We meet right under the balcony there. And Sharon Murray, who's very faithful to prayer time, sits on the front row, such a sweet and wonderful person. She said, when are people going to wake up? When are we going to call upon the Lord? When are we going to see that judgment is coming? Because just as God sent judgment to Egypt, he's going to send judgment to us. How do we know that? Because the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Lord is holy, holy, holy. And the Lord hates sin. And he's patient with us. But his patience doesn't last forever. Why was he so harsh with Egypt? Because, reason number one, Egypt was ripe, ripe for judgment. Because, reason number two... Egypt needed to know that the Lord alone is God. They didn't know that. They needed to know that. Verse 5, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. Then they're going to know it. And when I destroy them in the Red Sea, they're going to know that the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. That's what happened on Mount Carmel under the ministry of Elijah when he called the prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel and all the people. He said, the God that answers by fire, he is God. And when the prophets of Baal tried to call on Baal, Baal couldn't answer because Baal's not God. But when Elijah called on the Lord, the Lord answered with fire and the people said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And that's what's getting ready to happen in Egypt. Everyone is getting ready to say, the Lord, he is God. Now, there was a merciful sign before the first plague. God is a merciful God. Remember this about God. God is a savior. He's also a judge, but God longs to save He doesn't long to to judge people for sin. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For the Father did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. He would have been right to send the Son into the world to judge the world, but he didn't. He sent him as a Savior. He's coming back again as judge. He's coming back again to judge. In righteousness, he judges and wages war. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. So here we have God sending Moses to Pharaoh. Look at verse 6 again. So Moses and Aaron did it as the Lord commanded them. Thus they did. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Now stop right there. How old was Moses when he began his ministries? 80 years old. How old was Aaron? 83. How old are you? A lot of people say, well, I'm too old. We just retired Olin Owens, one of my dearest friends in the whole world. I think the world of Olin, 84. I pointed out this scripture to him. I said, Olin, you want to be a slacker? And you're only 84. (laughs) Moses is getting rolling. At 80, hey, God can use you, even if you're in your 80s or beyond. Verse 8, now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, work a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh. Now, take your staff. He's talking about Moses' staff. There's only the one staff that God caused uh, in Exodus chapter 4, God caused to be a serpent, and that was called the rod of God. But here they're just saying, hey, Aaron, because Aaron is Moses' mouthpiece because Moses uh, was too afraid to just trust God for himself. And so God says, okay, Moses, uh, you have a brother, Aaron. Let him speak to you. You be like God. He'll be like your prophet. He can speak through you. So don't get concerned or, or confused on the staff. Everything that's done is with the rod of God. 
So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. For each one threw down his staff, and they turned into serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs, staffs, yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. First time it says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He's hardening, hardening his own heart here. And so God gives a reprieve. This is before any plagues come. And you have the staff of God going up against the serpent of Egypt. Now, if you remember the pharaohs, their headdress, what did they have in the middle of their headdress? It was a cobra. We have a picture to show right there. Pharaoh would wear that that type of a headdress, and it had a cobra there. Uh, The cobra was a symbol of divine authority because Pharaoh said he was a god. And they would worship the cobra and the serpent. And so you have the staff of God going up against the serpent of Egypt. See, Pharaoh is a picture of the devil Because the devil is called, Revelation chapter 12, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan. And so you have this cosmic battle taking place in the spiritual realm as well as in the physical realm. And God is giving an opportunity here. Hey, you see my power. Don't test me to see how strong I am. But he said, ah, magicians. We have the names of two of them from 2 Peter chapter 3, Janus and Jambres. Hey, see what you can do. And so they did some kind of magical trick, whether it's black magic or some kind of sleight of hand. I don't know what it was, but the devil has power. He can cause fire to come down from heaven, it says in Revelation chapter 13. He has power to do certain things. And so he made, with his magical arts, he made the, the staff into serpents. But Aaron's Serpent ate theirs to show that God is going to make mince meat out of you. He's going to eat you up. But Pharaoh didn't respond. His heart was hardened. So God is going to bring the plagues. Here come the plagues. And they were increasingly intense plagues from God that followed. He has a merciful sign And then here come the plagues. Verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water and station yourself to meet him on the bank of the Nile and you shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent and you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. Thus says the Lord, thus says Yahweh, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. He says it again, that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with the staff that is in my hand, and it shall be turned into blood. And the fish that are in the Nile will die, and the Nile will become foul, and the Egyptians will find difficulty in drinking water from the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, over the streams, and over their pools, and over their reservoirs of water, that they may become blood, that there shall be blood throughout the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. So Moses and Aaron did, even as the Lord had commanded, and he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. And the fish that were in the Nile died. And the Nile became foul so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And the blood was throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Then Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern even for this. So all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the Nile. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. First plague, water 
to blood, the Nile to blood. Now, the Egyptian god of the Nile was a god named Hapi, H-A-P-I, Hapi. He was the one that was over the Nile. He was the God. They called him Lord of the fish and birds of the marshes, Lord of the river bringing vegetation. And the Egyptians knew when the Nile would overflow its banks, it would leave behind sediment that made for really good soil, and they would grow crops there, and uh, they would flourish. And so they worshiped Hapi. Now, sounds like happy, but I'm going to show you a picture of Hoppy. And if you look like that, you wouldn't be very happy. Here's a picture of Hoppy. He's got a little bit of a pot belly, and he's, he's got some man boobs. Um, he's, uh, it's kind of bad. Uh, you don't want to look like that. That guy needs to do bench press or something. I don't, you know, he's got to fix that. But anyway, that, that's their God that they worship, Hoppy. And God turns the Nile into blood. Now, significant. Moses' first, first plague, water to blood. Jesus' first miracle in the New Testament, water to wine. Water to blood is gruesome. Water to wine is gladsome. Moses was over the law. The law condemns us. The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. The law says you can't make it. The law says the soul that sins shall surely die, and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the law condemns us, and it is gruesome, and it says there's death for you, but grace found in the Lord Jesus Christ says there's life in Jesus Christ. Very interesting about this first miracle. But it takes this God, Hoppy, and just destroys him. The, the Lord of the fish and the birds of the marshes, I mean, all the fish die. Now, you have some liberal theologians that like to say, well, this wasn't really a miracle. This wasn't really a, a judgment from God. I mean, it, it, there was just, there were some microbes in the water that made it look red. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Just immediately like that, and then it killed all the fish. I mean, they have microbes in the water now in the Nile. It doesn't turn red, and it doesn't kill all the fish. No, this was from God, and it happened immediately when Aaron stretched the rod of God over the waters. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he didn't care about that. He had no concern over that. And even in God's judgment, there's mercy because there are some freshwater sources that the Egyptians could dig around and get some water. Otherwise, they would have all died uh, with no water to drink. But see, they were killing Hebrew baby boys in the Nile. And God says, okay, you're killing uh, my people's my people in the Nile, I'm going to turn your Nile to blood. Egyptians hated blood. That was uh, an abomination to them. They didn't have blood sacrifices in Egypt, and God turns their whole water source into blood. That's the first plague. Then you have the second plague, the plague of the frogs. Chapter 8, then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. And the Nile will swarm with frogs, which come up and go into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into your houses of your servants and on your people and into your ovens and your kneading boils. So the frogs will come up on you and your people and all your servants. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand. With your staff over the rivers, over the streams, over the pools, and make frogs come up out of the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did the same with their secret arts, making frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Egypt worshipped frogs. They had a special goddess named Hecate, H E K. E -T, or H-E-Q-E-T, sometimes spelled either way. She was the goddess of fertility, and she had a frog face. They liked frogs. They said frogs show fertility, and so we like frogs. And God says, well, you like frogs. I got a whole warehouse full of frogs I'm going to send to you. 
They're going to come up all over you. You're going to find them in your bed at night. You're going to find them in your cabinets. You're going to find them in your, in your bowls. They're just going to be everywhere. You're going to have a frog fest for a while here because I am bringing judgment upon you, and I'm going to crush this goddess Hecate. And the Lord brought, brought frogs. Now, isn't it interesting? The magicians, they could bring frogs too. It's like we don't have enough frogs. Pharaoh says, hey, magicians, can you make some more frogs? I mean, wouldn't it be better to say, hey, magicians, can you make the frogs go away? They couldn't do that, but they could make more frogs. The devil is a copycat. He just can do things that God can do. He can't do everything, obviously, that God can do, but he can do some things. And so they made frogs come up. And Pharaoh, it says in verse 9, or verse 8, then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may remove the frogs from me and from my land, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Plague number two, he's ready to let the people go. He didn't care anything. He had no concern when the Nile became blood. He's got concern now because his land is overrun with frogs. And he says, I'll let you go. But when the plague of the frogs ceases, when there's relief, he hardens his heart again. And then you have plague number three, the plague of the gnats. Verse 16, then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth that it may become gnats throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. And Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians tried with their secret arts to bring forth gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Now, the, the, the Egyptian god of the earth and the dust was Geb, G-E-B. He's the God of the earth, the God of the dust. So what does God do? He causes the dust to become gnats. Some versions say lice, but most theologians believe these are gnats. Now, two church fathers lived in Egypt, and these two church fathers, uh, Philo and Origen, they said there were gnats in Egypt that were nasty little creatures. They, they would sting you, and they would, were painful, and they would creep into your eyes and into your ears and into your nose. They called them uh, biting midges. They call them sand gnats. They call them uh, punkies. They call them no see because they're so small. Smallest ones are 1 25th of an inch. They call them flying teeth. I have a picture of one blown up so you can see what these gnats were like. It's a little gnat bite you. This is a man with gnats on his hand. And they would bite you and it would be, uh, create a sore. They had gnats all over the land. And the Egyptian musicians tried so hard. Maybe we can make some more gnats. No, we can't make any more gnats. Pharaoh, this is the finger of God because we can't make any gnats. Plague number three is gnats. So we've had water to blood. We've had frogs. We've had gnats. And they're already saying this is the finger of God. And God is just warming up. He had a bunch more plagues getting ready to come down the pike. Egypt needed to know that the Lord alone is God. So what do we learn from Egypt's sin and stubbornness? Because it's going to be seven more before Pharaoh finally breaks. What do we learn from the first three plagues? Number one, a hard heart will face increasing pressure from a good God. Pharaoh kept hardening his heart. Hey, I know when I preach on any given Sunday or Wednesday or any other time of the week that I might be preaching, Jesus told us there are different kinds of soil. There's, there's the hard soil, there's the shallow soil, there's the thorny soil, and then there's the good soil. 
the good soil, when the seed comes into the good soil, it, it receives it, it welcomes it, and produces a crop 30-fold, 60-fold, even 100-fold. The seed that falls on the hard pan, that doesn't penetrate at all, and the birds of the, heaven, uh, of the heavens come and snatch it away. The birds of the heaven are pictures of the, the devil coming and snatching away the seed. Hey, the Word of God, when it goes out into your heart, what, what does it find? What does it hit? What kind of soil do you have? Is it hard? Pharaoh's heart was hard. And God had to keep bringing more pressure and more pressure and more pressure. And the pressure comes from a good God. Why? Because God wants you to respond to him. Some of you watch MMA. In MMA, they have this thing. You know, MMA is basically, we lock you in this place until you just beat the snot out of each other and and you got some pretty skilled guys in in hand-to-hand combat and they can get you in different holds an arm bar a leg bar some kind of bar that's about ready to break your bones and what are they trying to do get you to tap out tap out if you don't tap out i'm going to break your arm well god just keeps applying pressure how long before you tap out Proverbs 29, verse 1, a man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. God puts us in situations where he says, will you yield to me? Listen, mark it down. You're not going to beat God. He is God. He is, as we sang today, he is bigger, he's stronger, he's better. His ways are right concerning everything. I'm going to shake my puny little fist in the face of God and say, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? He could incinerate me just like that. That's who the Lord is. Hey, a hard heart will face increasing pressure from a good God. When the Lord met Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, he says in Saul's own words, And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. A goad is that sharp, pointy stick. And when the oxen doesn't go where the owner wants it to go, he keeps jabbing in the hind parts of that ox to get him to go in the right direction. And what does the ox do? He invariably kicks against that goad but he can't get the goad he can't kick it so the more he kicks the more he gets jabbed it's hard to kick against the goad and God's like I I can do this all day long how long do you want to keep doing that how long before you tap out a hard heart will face increasing pressure from a good God secondly when you see God at work at work in your heart yield to him and follow through Very interesting, I left these these scriptures out on purpose, and I'll go through them very quickly. Exodus 8, verse 8. With the plague of the frogs. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may remove the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go and they may that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, The honor is yours. When I shall entreat for you, tell me when I shall entreat for you and your servants, and your people, that the frogs may be destroyed from you in your houses, that they may be left only in the Nile. Then he said, tomorrow. So he said, may it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God, and the frogs will depart from you and your houses, and your servants, and your people. They will be left only in the Nile. Then Pharaoh Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had inflicted upon Pharaoh, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, the courts, and the fields, so they piled them in heaps, and the land became foul. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them as the Lord had said." Hey, when God begins to work in your heart and you know he's working in your heart and you know your heart is hard, what do you do? Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Behold, today is the day of salvation. You respond to him. And when you say you're going to do something, you follow through. I had a guy some years ago come to my office. 
His, his life was filled with frogs, so to speak. He had given himself over to, to all these sins. He was drinking, and the, the, the drinking all, all of a sudden got a hold of him, and then he couldn't control it anymore, and it was wrecking his life. He said, my life is a mess. What do I do? And I said, you need to get right with God, and you need to start getting yourself plugged into church. I said, you were doing so well when you were coming to church on Sunday morning, when you were involved in a Sunday school class, when you were coming on Wednesday night, when you were reading the Word, when you were praying. I said, that's what you need to do. He said, I'll do it. And he did it for one week, and he quit doing it. I saw him one Wednesday night. I didn't see him again until I did his funeral. Because he killed himself. Hard heart. Said he was going to do it. Oh, things are tough. I'm going to do it. But he didn't do it. He didn't follow through. Just like Pharaoh. And isn't it amazing? The honor is yours, Moses said. You tell me, Pharaoh, when you want me to pray to ask God to remove the frogs. And Pharaoh said... Tomorrow. Tomorrow? The honor is yours? You got frogs jumping all over your bed? The honor is yours? Not now? No, tomorrow. We'll just do it tomorrow. And not today. We should have one more night with the frogs. That's okay. One more night with the frogs. You know, that speaks to so many people. That's what we do with sin. We say, well, tomorrow I'll get right. Tomorrow I'll get rid of this. Tomorrow I'll make a change. Come now, the Lord says, Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together. You don't, you don't have the promise of tomorrow. All you have is today. Many people come to church and they hear the call that God says, hey, it's time for you to come out of your sin and come to me. And they say, I'll do it tomorrow. How many people might have said during the days of Noah when he was preaching and the ark was there and the door of the ark was open. You know, I think I believe what Noah's saying. I'll come and get on the ark tomorrow. But then God closed the door of the ark and the day of salvation was over. The day of grace was over. They didn't come. They were waiting on tomorrow, but tomorrow didn't come. Come now. Do business with God now. Now is the acceptable time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Listen, I don't know where you are in your relationship with God, but I'm speaking to two groups of people. One group, you're lost. You've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, and you're, you're participating in sin, and it's kind of like the prodigal son experience. Hey, this is fun. You know, when the prodigal son left the, the father's house and he started to spend his money, he was spending it on wine, women, and song. It was fun for a while. Sin is fun for a while. The Bible talks about the passing pleasures of sin. And maybe you're having fun in sin and you're saying, this is awesome. I mean, uh, I'm not experiencing any judgment of God. You just wait. You know, the fish is nibbling on the, the worm on, that's connected to a hook. And it tastes pretty good until they set the hook. And then it's not so good. The prodigal son ran out of money and he ends up at the pigsty and life is terrible. Hey, it's time for you to get right with God. You don't know what's going to happen to you down the road. Now is the time. Not tomorrow, now. So for the lost person, you need to come to Jesus today and give him your heart and life. And he'll save you and forgive you and give you uh, a future and a hope. Second person group of people. You're the Christian and you're not walking with God and you know you're not walking with God. You know you got frogs in your life, but you think you can control the frogs. You think, you, oh, I can handle this. You know, I know I'm drinking a little bit, but it's no big deal. You know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, doing some things that aren't so good over here and aren't so good over there, and I'm flirting around with this person at the office, and, but I can control it. It's not that bad. I really haven't crossed the line yet. You're getting ready to see frogs unleashed in your life you're getting ready to step over a line you don't even know it but the devil is setting you up for a trap and listen today if you hear his voice respond to him harden not your heart respond to God get your life right with God listen our world is going to hell in a handbasket do you not see that 
And we need to get right, and we need to stay right, and we need to call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and we need to stand in the gap of the land because judgment is coming to this world. Just like it came to Egypt, it will come to America. Listen, this is what I believe. I believe that there will be a revival that will come to our land. I don't think it will change the trajectory of anything as far as what's going to happen. God's, that is in motion, but it will change eternity for many people as they respond to Christ. That can start today. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, you can come to know him today. If you're here and you're not walking with Jesus, you can start walking with him today. Listen, the altar is open to pray, and we need to be praying for lost Uh, family members and lost friends and lost classmates and workmates and people in the community because judgment is coming because God is holy, holy, holy. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Our God is faithful and true and I want to ask you, do you know him? Not just know about him, but do you really know him? Know him in your heart. If not, today can be the day for you. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. I believe you're coming back to rule and reign. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more at fromhisheart.org. Real truth.